the music industry is not always about the, the, it's it's not the best industry to be in to make money but combine the passion for this industry the music industry dj specifically maybe electronic and and software it's just it's just what i want to wake up for it's not often that i'm flabbergasted from a product demo but i was with stagent a few weeks ago when i got the demo of their product this is a really interesting talk. Misha was really honest and had a lot of great insights of how it is to be a founder in the music industry. Hi, Misha, and welcome to Sound Connections. It's very good to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me, Jacob. Thank you. You and me, we, we met at a demo because uh, one of the companies that I work with is a booking company, and we were using a system that uh, we had, oh, we felt okay about it, but we wanted to try something different. And then we ended up having a demo with you about <laughs> Stagent, which is a really interesting system. Can you, can you briefly explain me what is Stagent? Uh, correct. Yeah, Stagent is a platform for booking agencies as well as artists to manage their bookings from A to Z. So we take care of everything related to the booking, getting there, um, being at the show, uh, payments, invoicing, contracts, you name it, everything related to it. Yeah. And what was so interesting for me when I went through the demo was that it was so intuitive and it was so thought, thought through. And it's really clear that this is there's been a very clear vision behind the product, uh, but also the understanding of the industry and sort of what different needs are. Uh, so, But we, we'll go, go get back to the product very soon cool. um, because this is a founder's episode. So it is as much about you and your journey and how that led to Stagent. So who are you? Uh, well, my name is Misha. I'm 29 years old, and uh, actually, from the start of 14, 15, or something, I always uh, found myself busy with business things, uh, doing little job side hustles, that kind of stuff. I uh, actually started DJing when I was 14. Um, did some gigs here and there. Um, and that came to a point where the attendance officer sent a letter to my parents that I had to perform better at school. So I wasn't able to perform anymore to my 18. And at that point, yeah, it was, it was kind of harsh for me because I had to focus on school, but I wanted to do other things like perform. Um, back when I became 18, I tried to pick, off, uh, where, uh, pick up where I left off, but figured out that I wasn't really relevant anymore because due to the age of being 14 was way cooler to, to see me perform, I think, than my 18s. Um, so I figured that I needed to find a solution for that. And I started a booking agency to help my fellow DJ friends with their bookings, as well as get myself on prime time of the events that we were doing. So <laughs> that was actually very interesting. So uh, we got to a point where we did like 30 bookings or even 40 bookings a month and we realized that we needed software for that because we were using spreadsheets and it was kind of getting a mess and sort of handmade invoices everywhere and contracts that didn't make any sense uh, so that was the starting point actually for stage where i uh, really? we started doing yeah the business part yeah so so you're sort of an entrepreneur from the very beginning that felt very natural to you yes yeah it's something that always intrigued me in a way yeah yeah uh, but, but before you, you know, you, you went to stage and after this story, you had some experiences in different companies where you worked. Um, could you just sort of uh, go through the timeline uh, of what you did until you started your own booking agency as an 18 year old and then you started stage and what happened in between there? Yeah, correct. So um, let me think. I was about 19 or 20 when I had that booking agency and also did the quite some bookings myself but it always struck me that there needed to be like a platform to manage it all and I, I knew there was some competition in that area but I didn't have any connections no money no skill set I, I didn't know how to develop software so it, it was such a big project to me that I sort of flew flee from it and I um, then dived into the world of building websites it was also something that I out necessary for myself i needed a dj website to sell myself online sort of find find myself on google and i really like working in wordpress and it was sort of created creative process for me so at that time i started doing some uh, side hustles with creating websites for friends and for 
for some small businesses and stuff. And that made me um, be in touch with with a, a casino brand. And I started working for this casino company that owned 10 casinos in the Netherlands. And they needed a new website. And all of a sudden, I was building a website for this company. And it was so much fun. Um, that made me realize that this was something that I that I yeah found myself um, very creative in, and, and, and it was just a process of, of figuring things out. I won't call myself a developer, but rather a professional Googler. <laughs> um, so in that process, I uh, decided to stop with a booking agency, uh, stop performing as a DJ, and uh, go full on, on on the web development while working for this 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 company. Um, uh, then the company was bought by Novometics, a big uh, casino brand in uh, Austria. And during that process, I uh, uh, became a bit more um, invested in like development processes of the company, but I had to travel a lot. So I didn't really like that anymore. And then I ended up with a hosting company. Uh, that hosting company, I uh, started off at uh, the support uh, team to learn about everything related to the products and uh, then I ran up to like a marketing team. They didn't really had a marketing team at that time. And yeah, I just created it with some of my colleagues and yeah, we started doing, uh, some marketing funneling, uh, in, pl- in corporate like, sort of tools that, uh, the, the company relied on related to marketing. It was really fun. Um, but the, also the websites were, were going like crazy on the side. I did that as side hustle still in a very specific niche for, uh, DJs and, uh, and YouTubers where they sell merchandise and that took off. Uh, so the, the hosting company gave me the freedom to work less for them to really yeah ramp up the resources sure. for my own company. And then I decided to go full on on that company and, and yeah, uh, started really the, the first steps of my entrepreneurship as a solo entrepreneur. Um, and I did that for five years and then I realized that it, really didn't like to, to work for other brands. So I really wanted to work for my own brand. So I sold that company and that gave me the, the money and the knowledge of the five years before that to start a company like Stage It. And that's what I met with now. Yeah. That's an interesting journey because it, it, it really sounds like, you know, entrepreneurship has been your own only option in life. That's sort of what you felt you were made for. Is, is that true? Yes. Yeah. Um, I just really like to work a lot. I, I don't really see it as work. It's just my, my hobby. I, I, whenever I have time in the evenings or mornings or whatever, and I can be behind my MacBook and, and start working on, on things, it's just, it feels, it feels like the natural thing to me. And, um, doing that for like a boss or not your own company doesn't really feel the same and sure. seeing stage in every day on my screen like a product that my team and i pull is something to be proud of and and to yeah to, to start the day for you know so yeah it's it's really a thing that i um yeah it, 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 it's it's just if i follow my heart this is what i want to do yeah yeah so so you said you know Back in the days when you were 18, when you did all these manual invoices and spreadsheets and stuff, there was, there was a need for, for a, you know, a software like Stagent. So that must have been a, mm-hmm. you know, sort of a, an idea you carried on for many years then, like seven years that must yes. have been before. Yeah. And how did you practically go about it? Like you sold, you didn't, I guess you didn't sell your company before you started Stagent. It was like a simultaneous process. No. But can you, can you exactly. walk me through the process of starting Stagent? How do you go about it? Uh, this is an interesting one um, well, to me. Uh, so there's this one thing that I don't get about the industry and our competitors, basically. So uh, imagine you you have a, yeah, well, you have a booking agency, so you know this process, but like you try to sell as many artists as you can, right? So how it works with our competitors is that you add a booking for a specific artist, and then you add all the event details to that specific booking. And yeah, if you make another sale, which is something that you want to do over and over and over to the same event, you have to start that process again, add a booking to the system, add the event details, create a contract, create an invoice. And it's also like an annoying process for the promoter because they have to sign that contract again and another invoice. And then, and then maybe they want to have another artist and they have to do that whole process again. So the first thing that I want to test out with agencies that I have, uh, that I was in contact with is that you take the event as a top level entity and then add bookings to that. And then on event level, generate a contract and an invoice. 
and you know that process with staging now, but this is something that other companies don't offer, other software pl- platforms don't offer. And this is the first thing that I pitched to uh, some agents that I knew. And when they saw how easy it was to start doing some some optional bookings in, in, in our system, yeah, it was sort of mind-blowing for them that they just in a few clicks could accomplish that. And Fair. that was the moment that I thought like, yeah, I'm, I'm onto something with this idea, but it's not really there yet. So I started this MVP and that was back in 2018 maybe even. And in 2019, I really started the company. And 2021, I sold my previous agency to really go full on. So there's like an overlap of maybe two years or so. Yeah. And th- did you just start, you know, making it yourself? And like, how was the process of actually making it? At first, I like, like again, that professional Googler is, is really a thing still. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm still not calling myself a developer. I know my way around in our framework. We're working on uh, Laravel. Uh, I know my way around with HTML, PHP, and that kind of stuff. Like I can read it, but I'm not the guy who natively writes stuff. Uh, so back then, uh, when I did the websites, yeah, of course, WordPress is really easy for me. I can build teams and stuff like that. But I started my first project actually in WordPress to get my head around sort of workflow, how it should work. And then I started with a friend who uh, became a freelancer from the same hosting company, actually, Kevin. And he started working working on sort of mini MVP from the ideas that I sketched for him in WordPress. And that was yeah. a sort of cool workflow because we could like, yeah, um, play around with how it should work and 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 how it how it um, uh, how it looks and that kind of stuff. And we were also focusing on design a lot, something that is really important at that stage. But in, uh, design always is a is a very important part to me. It also brings a sort of calm to the UI and. and makes it uh give us gives it the xml factor uh but yeah at, at that point i had somebody who helped me with that first mvp hmm. that's cool and you know at what point did you feel like okay this is something i want to pursue and, and and sell my other company because you know selling a company is it's a big thing right it's something you've built up for five years like when did you feel comfortable with going full-time into stage agent um, so my previous company, Pixel Start, uh, became too big of an operation to manage on my own. So I had a few clients with really large web shops and, and the hosting infrastructure for that, it got to a point where I really wasn't focusing on building new websites. I was just maintaining hosting infrastructure. And that was not something I signed up for when I started this, this company, you know, I, I liked it and I like to do research about how I could optimize the hosting infrastructure. And of course, it's a really good way of rev- making revenue because, yeah, it, this this infrastructure has to run in a way that uh, when whenever there was a new product launch, like there were there were three four thousand people in a queue to get hands on their on that specific product. That was insane. And we had queuing systems in place to maintain that to to grant people access in a sort of uh, honest flow and 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 that combined with not being able to work on an own on your own brand but always having to work on somebody else's brand of course you work on the pixel star brand but it's not the same it's 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 not touchable in a sense that it's really a, a thing that people talk about you know you're always uh part of something else and yeah. those two in combination made it really easy for me to sell this yeah basically client list to, to somebody else um, and it helped that it's a really interesting client list because, yeah, the, the names that I work for, I'm, if I think about it, it's still crazy. It was so much fun to be able to work with these kind of names. But um, in the end, it was a really easy decision for me because because I, I, I was really happy with the little scene. You, you, you said it before, like it was in my hat for seven years now. And, and that got to a point where I was able to execute it. And that made it really easy for me to decide to sell it the first company and go full on on um, stage it. Yeah. And you said, you know, you saw the company, so you had a bit of capital. Is that capital you used just to sustain a living or did you already there go out and employ people? I don't know where it went actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, of course, it, it, it helped uh, um, making the decision to go on a new product because, yeah, I needed some funds to, uh, to, to, to live basically. But, on the other hand, I also invested a little bit in the company, but I also had an angel. My first ever angel was my uh, also my ex boss from PC Extreme from the hosting company, and he has a sort of 
rule. <laughs> uh, he invests 10K without questions, uh, if he likes it, of course. Then he does another 10K without any questions if it goes well. And then after 20K, he starts asking questions. And um, that got to a point where he um, added another 30K. So he was on a 50K uh, investment. And um, when, it become, when it became very serious, I found another company who was uh, willing to invest development resources for around 125K. And that was combined with another investor from Austria, Tim Moser, who is uh, um, the, one of the founders of Electric Globe Festival. Uh, and he also invested around 100K. So yeah. um, Leonard, the first angel, did another additional 60 or 70, I believe. So yeah, there, there were quite some funds coming in into stage and to make it um, a product where we are right now. And uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, most startups when when they when they build stuff within let's call it the music industry, if you can call this the music industry, it's definitely a service towards the music industry. Ha- have a hard time finding investors, but it seems like this was a more of a, like a natural process for you, or like did you need to really go and look for it? No. Um, this has been a pain in the ass for a long time. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, actually, at the beginning of this year, it got to a point where it was becoming very risky uh, because the investors didn't want to invest more. Um, because it, uh, you you might uh, understand this well because you have an agency, but like the, the customer journey to get people on your product is quite hard because I'm a guy that tries to do apps at least four times a year. Like, um, I always get back to do this, but I like to try other ones to see if they're better. Like I knew I like new things and I like software, but that, that doesn't mean that everybody likes that. Like most people don't like changes. Uh, they, they want to stick to the things they have because they, they know how it works. Uh, they like it. Um, but if they see how easy staging is and how, um, how, 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 you know, love time they, they can, they can win with that by just using our platform. That is something that is really USB now. But to get to that point, we really had to uh, to develop a lot of yeah features. And uh, in my head, I'm still not on the point where we are, uh, where we where we should be, of course. Like there's always that one feature that you need in, in my head. Yeah. But um, in, in that sense, yeah, it, 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 it's never finished, you know? Um, yeah. No, that it's it's interesting, you know, about you know the the time it takes to onboard a client. You know, the the reason why that we use Stagen was basically just because we we used another platform, and then that car mm-hmm. had expired, and we forgot to renew it. And then like, oh, uh, the 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 subscription's expired. Uh, uh, should we just renew it, or should we look for something else? And then that's you know, actually very randomly, I I had booked a demo meeting with Stagen for for some other reason. Just because I was curious, and that that day I got a stage in email, They're like hey, reminding you of the of the demo we had. So it was really like even us that's sort of a let's call it a, a beginning agency that's you know very curious about technology, don't really consider that much changing a system. So I can imagine that's really a big work winning over clients. It's 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 one of the the the, the biggest hassles we face now, but. On the other hand, now we have now that we have more features coming in, it's also becoming an easier process to sh- to, to to make a sale. So, I think it's sort of product related, um, and and since we we are at the point where we're developing features that are differentiating us from our competitors, um, like for instance the press kit, like a lot of people really like that press kit feature we have. No yeah. Dropbox link or whatever, just a, a place where we host the page, everything related to that press kit. Um, it's it's such an easy thing, and it's actually something that we needed for the, the agency that I have myself now as well. Um, well this is a, maybe a, a nice side uh, side hustle. So, side story: um, I I started DJing again <laughs> two two three years ago in in Hartstel, and I was with a booking agency, but. I, First, I didn't really like their platform because they were using ABOS. So as an artist, I was using ABOS to it. But I have my own platform, so why would I? So I had a friend who was copying over everything. But yeah, of course, that was weird. And then they didn't really felt the need to be with that booking agency. So we started our own booking agency, True Identity. And True Identity started beginning this year using Stagent as a pilot so we could use our product 
in, 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 in real cases because you can develop something and you can test it. And of course it works, but does it really work in like workflows? And then we figured a lot of things were like optimized uh, enough in, in, in good workflow. So we use uh, True Identity as, yeah, as, as a real company to, um, for now we, we manage 16 artists. Um, but as uh, on the same side, we're also testing stage in, in, in like real case examples. And that was also the, the, the idea behind the, the press kit because we wanted to share press kits. We didn't just want to upload it to Dropbox. So that is how we got to that press kit feature. Um, so on the side, uh, we, we run, uh, yeah, uh, try to, to really figure out ways, um, and uh, to incorporate really nifty features and stuff in our own workflow. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And you know, that's probably also why I felt like it, it, it seems so intuitive when we, when we had the demo. Um, but I think you, you mentioned your lone founder, uh, you started staging together. Is, is that, is that how you, how it is? Mm-hmm. No, I, I started staging on my own, uh, with the help of a developer on the side, but I just paid him a, a small fee for the work that he did. Um, and I always worked with freelancers up until the point that we had a, a, a good investment. And I hired, hired my first developer full-time from the UK uh, in 2020, I believe. And he stuck with the company for one and a half years. Um, insane kid. Like, uh, he, he is also a, quite a, a, a big name in the open source world. I, I believe that he was 20 or 21 or something when I hired him. But seriously, good whiskey. Like he has such a skill set. He he built the complete app how it is now. Well, not now, but like the, the core of it from the MVP within four months or so. It was insane. At first, I didn't want to do it because I want to stuck with the MVP. But he said, ah, let's let's rebuild it. It's going to be better. And he did that whole thing on his own. Like insane, insanely good. And um, I'm still sad that he left because he he, he got he got this offer from a, a U.S. company with. With a with a salary that I yeah yeah insane in, the prices yeah. in the US are so high for for developers it's insane so I couldn't match that and uh, he also wanted to be with other developers in a team and uh, here yeah. he was just lonely uh, <laughs> sort of with, with yeah um, but yeah I was really happy to have him for the first part because he set like a sort of standard in our code quality as well and every time we hire a developer uh, they tell like yeah this is an insane good app like everything is so well structured and uh, I can tell um, because I can read it but like I, I every time a new developer comes in and they, they start talking about our application uh, it's always good to to know that our core is is like setting high standards yeah yeah but like and so, then about so- like the um, sorry about the question of course like um, I always did this uh, solo wait let me turn off my notifications I always did this solo um and last year in uh, November I uh, I uh, were a bit earlier on I just called all my uh, competitors I just called them and I said like hey uh, I'm Misha I started a company that might be a competitor for you soon uh but I just want to meet and uh, let's uh, see if you're open to that and uh, funny enough they all went in and they told me so much details about that company and, and what they were doing for years. And even a boss, I had the call with their CTO and they were, they were sharing so much information. It was so funny. Um, but also, uh, the, the, the founder behind Artwin a company around uh, it, that's around for 20 years now, uh, focusing more on, on like life artists, uh, uh, singer songwriters and bands. Um, the conversation with him were very, very nice. And, uh, and at the, at a point I got to realize that it was maybe a good idea to offer him a sort of merge or a partnership or whatever. So the last half year we were negotiating about how we're going to do it. And like his platform is uh, sort of outdated, but really good foundation for, uh, inspiration for staging and a lot of, uh, different industry needs actually that he already has built, which we can, uh, incorporate this agent and we're now looking into we merged in uh, in august and uh and now i'm with a co-founder which is really helpful to have somebody on the side to be able to talk about the product and not just have an idea in my mind and work it out and think that's the best solution because now you can really brainstorm about things and have have like a 
proper idea from the start to work on. And that is really helpful to me. And we have a bigger customer base. Uh, uh, went from startup to scale up in, in, in a few months, actually. And now we're investigating how we can migrate everything from art into stage within the upcoming year. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, but of course, you know, you, you got a co-founder now. Uh, but the journey until till now for, you know, for, for many, many years has been solo. How have you tackled the level of discipline that takes and the level of focus that takes? Because that's not everyone who can do that. Um, my focus is bad. Like if I, if I quit my, I give myself advice, um, that would be focus on one thing. Um, there was a point that I, I brought a, a sort of, book to get my ha- head around an idea i thought that i learned something from an interview with steve jobs where he mentioned something about five products at once or something but i tried to find that interview and it's something that i took from that but inspired me to create a format that you can only have five projects at once but if you have a kid it counts as a project you have a relationship it counts as a project if you go out with friends a lot it's a project because you invest time in it right uh, so I got to this idea, the five project rule, um, where you have sort of structure that you can only fit five projects in your in your window. Do you want to take something on, uh, which is the six? You have to drop one off to do that six one to, to get to five again. And in a sense, it works. But even though I, I've, I've written a book about it, like a short book, uh, to, to get my uh, my head around the system. I can't even incorporate it in my own life <laughs> because I tend to do so many things on the side. And if something is not going fast enough for me, I tend to find my, um, said it, like my spark in another thing. So when it was going bad with staging, I was, I was starting true identity because like, yeah, with staging, it, it, there was bad negativity. I had to inform my investors all the time. We couldn't find money. It was a hassle to get the deal with Artwin going. So, I needed to have a spark and I couldn't get that spark from staging at that moment. So I tend to do something else. And, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bad way. And if I could get, get control about that, um, uh, it, it, it would be beneficial for the company. But yeah. at the same time, uh, true identity brought a lot of good things to staging. So, uh, to get to your question, yeah, it, it, it is hard for me to focus on things, but at the same time, I think that is what gets me on the roll all the time. Yeah. And um, discipline-wise, it's not hard for me to to have discipline. Um, uh, but it, 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 somebody described once that is sort of my rocket. So I can be in a rocket, uh, but that rocket only focuses on one thing again. So if I want to work out a lot or uh, I'm focusing on that specifically and everything else has, has to drop for that. So you could tell that's discipline. But the discipline is also focused on one thing. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's sort of a bad thing, but it also keeps me on track on the things that I need to achieve. And um, I'm mostly in my stage of rocket, of course. Uh, even nowadays, with the whole merger, like I'm, I'm on top of the game now, and uh, that keeps me on track. Yeah, I, I I think that's really interesting. And thank you for being open and honest about it. I think that's something a lot of founders, especially in the creative industries, uh, experience. Uh, especially me. Like I can, you know. Whenever you talk, I'm like, okay, that's hundred percent me. You know, one of the reasons why why I'm doing the podcast is because I need stimulation. What's funny about the synergy is the same with true identity. You know, this podcast has only been out for two and a half months, but I've gotten so many opportunities because of the podcast. It's people like, you know, tell me like this person listens to the podcast, like that person listens to the podcast. Okay, that's cool. And and but because because I think that's the same thing with, you know, yeah. people like you and I, it's we need the stimulation, but then we also high performers. Maybe like it, we really yeah. work effectively, and there's some there's big downsides to that. And it, if I, at least in my experience, you know, being able to navigate the downsides is more the the hard thing than doing the actual work. The actual work is easy if it's sparked, um, but in my yeah, in, like, in my experience, I can imagine that with like running a podcast, it's not only discipline; it, it's it's more. It's it's like an extra form of discipline because you need consistency with that. Yeah. If you if you um, forget about one show or something, or you think like, yeah, I'm gonna postpone one to a week later or so, like, 
yeah, it, it already breaks the, the consistency of it and that breaks your discipline in my head. Hmm. So I, th- I think it's a really cool thing for you to, to, to do because it, it learns you about discipline and it gives sort of structure to something in your life. And that's also yeah. a good thing to have. Yeah. So, so how do you see your, your journey moving on? Right now, you're in an in- interesting place where you're sort of merging with other company uh, and, and there's a lot of things happening there. What do you believe are the next steps for Stagent as a company? Um, yeah, they're, they're, we were thinking about so setting up a big hairy goals, uh, uh, of which one uh, is, is uh, yeah, setting milestones for the migration, of course, to um, uh, deprecate the whole art and platform, to have everybody full on, on Stagent. Um, and at the second we have an idea of acquiring other companies to scale faster. Um, which companies will we focus on? I can't really tell you, of course, but um, there are some competitors that we think um, are not really focusing on development anymore. Uh, they tend to have um, a focus to other uh, software platforms instead of maintaining the platform that they are a competitor's platform, so to speak. Uh, so sure. that is something we might focus on as well. And of course, we have a huge roadmap of so many cool features. Like I'd love to show you after the call. Uh, with, <laughs> but there's so many, so many, so many cool ideas. We're actually working on like advancing now. Uh, we are revamping our invoicing system. We have a complete new dashboard. Uh, we are adding event statuses. We're adding chats to the system. Um, we're adding uh, requests uh, for uh, the promoters to log in so they can maintain the booking as well and see everything related to the contracts and invoicing. So many ideas. Artist websites, really cool. So yeah, a lot of new things going on. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of things to do, you know, and, you know, uh, we just had an episode with uh, with Eskad in Norway, you know, that's also really tackling a lot of the practical advancing aspects of an event. So it's really interesting to see that you guys are going further in those thoughts. And and you as a you as a founder, um, what's your plans with with staying focused, with staying motivated? What do you need? Well, honestly, um, with the merger, we got to this point where being a solo entrepreneur is great because you have the flexibility to work on whatever you want, you know, and uh, whenever you want, you have a lot of freedom. But with that freedoms, also comes a lot of responsibilities. And you also have to do stuff that you don't like. And you have you have to do things that you really don't like. And one of these things is finance. I hate finance. Like, I hate it. And my new co-founder loves it. So like, right. there's this synergy between like product that we really like, but he gives me the freedom to work on product alone, you know. And and he like when I'm working on, for instance, a new marketing website for for stage and now and or or some UI changes or stuff like that, like front end. I tend to be in this focus thing, and he just lets me. He he, he even uh, does does stuff for me, so I don't so I can be in my focus, and that is something that ma- motivates me so much, and uh, that brings back energy that is insanely good for me. And 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 at the same time, I feel that he is focusing on the things that he's really liking. So, yeah, it, 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 I think that is that is enough for me right now to to stay on track and to to stay motivated. Yeah, of course, the whole merger is is still uh, pretty fresh, like three months. So we're still in the excitement of that as well. And and we um, we learned recently that you have to celebrate all the, the the small baby steps as well. So we we tend to do that and bring new energy in the, in, in the office as well. Yeah. So so as a part of the merger, you talked about sort of the dire situation of fundraising because you know building, especially software like you guys, that's sort of subscription based, takes time to build momentum. So, so what's the need for capital in the future? Like, do you, do you still need to fundraise, or like, are you self sustaining to some degree? Yeah. So we're focusing on uh, on a few things. Uh, with the merger, we found an investor who invested uh, um, uh, one hundred thousand, and um, we have a, a quite a long runway. So we hired a new developer. Well, we we are in the process of hiring him from January, and uh, with that process, we are yeah, trying to figure out how we can improve the runway uh, do we have price increases or not or um, are we gonna invest in marketing um, and 
we are not really in need of new funds, but if we have funds, we can grow faster. So we have two options for that. We have some very big Dutch agencies who are willing to give an advance on their uh, subscription for like quite a few years, so eight to 10 years or so, which brings in like 25 to 30K per, uh, per team. And we have three or four of them. And on the other hand, uh, we are focusing on uh, doing another round um, but only if we see that it's really necessary. And honestly, we are, we are, um, how do you say that? Like we're growing and, and, and doing an okay, uh, revenue at this point. So we don't really see the urge to focus on that too much. Yeah. And it, it takes some time to get there. So, you, you know, you've been, you've been, you know, doing this for four years and, and had a merger in order to, to make that happen. Um, yeah, but I think the process would be easier now. Like, uh, with stage and alone, I was in a, in a process where the um, the chances were there and the product was good, but the customer journey was too hard. And also because stage wasn't having too much customers yet, it was also assigned to other potential leads that they were backing off a bit. Like, yeah, uh, prove yourself first. Like, if I'm gonna invest in this. Uh, I yeah. want to know that you'll stick around for like at least a decade or something. So, uh, yeah, uh, all valid points that I couldn't really tell them, uh, give them another answer to. But since the merger, we are a healthy company. We have over 250 cooking agencies using our platform, both on Artwin and Stage, and, and some are, uh, of them are already migrating to Stage. And since that, we also see uh, users from Avos and System One and Gigwell coming to our platform. So. Yeah, it, it, it's. I think just a process of time and um, and and keep keep sort of the the, the stage and trigger going around with them. Uh, that might be a little ad or a call or check in or maybe at a festival somebody sees uh, another artist with our app. It could be tiny things, but if we stick around for long enough, uh, we'll get there. Yeah, I think that's a super important aspect of of a founder's journey is time. You know, things takes time to land customers to sort of get your team right, get your own mentality right. So that, that's really inspiring. Cool. And so you've been an entrepreneur like since you were a kid. You're an entrepreneur now. Is that where you see your life being the rest of your life? Is that an entrepreneur? Yeah, I think so. Once you go there, I think it's really hard to ever get back in a normal routine or like work for a boss. And I think you know what I mean. So it's not that I wouldn't want that. Like, of course, you can have like a directional level or a C level fu- function within a company or so, but it's not the same as feeling that it's your own thing. You know, like if I if I wake up, the first thing in the morning is I think about okay, what's what I'm going to do about the product today or uh, the things in my to do list. How can I accomplish that today? And I think you don't have the same feeling if it's not really your product. Of course, you can make it yourself. You can be part of a company, but it's not the same thing. But, so I don't see myself in a situation where I, um, how do you say that, work for a company. No. Yeah, and, and maybe that's also what it takes to really be an entrepreneur because the journey is so hard and it's so little rewarding in like, you know, financial gain if you over a short amount of time i imagine the the jobs you did for other companies were, were much more lucrative than the journey you've been on with Dajan, right absolutely <laughs> absolutely I, it, it's so i um i dare to say that i know how to build good soft software um and it doesn't really uh, matter which industry it is and if i chosen another industry to work with i think i could have made a lot of more money like a lot yep. to build software uh because the music industry is not always about the, the, it's it's not the best industry to be in to make money but combine the passion for this industry the music industry dj specifically maybe electronic and and software it's just it's just what i want to wake up for and that um makes i think that also uh adds up to being a entrepreneur that you do what you love and um, money is not really the main main focus of course it's important to 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 be healthy and to to be able to do what you want to do in life but it's not the the main factor for me to uh 
to get out of bed. Yeah. Yeah, you, you learn a lot from, from running a podcast. And one of the things that I hear consistently is the issue about the music industry not being comparable to other industries with the worth that it compensates if you succeed. Um, and that's that's a huge dilemma. Um, but I, I'm in the same boat as you. Like, you know, music industry is what I'm passionate about. Uh, building companies is what I'm passionate about. So that's what I'm going to do. But why, why do you think it is so? What's your commentary on why the music industry is so little rewarding compared to other opportunities? It's a hard question. Um, I think it's not specifically little rewarding. I think the gap is larger. So you have a lot of, you have a very, very, very big pool that doesn't really, uh, that is not able to live from their income as an artist. Then you have like a second pool of people that do stuff professionally, but are on the lower end that we just talked about. And then there is like a very, very high proportion of small people uh, that make a lot of money with the music industry. And between this two pools, there's like a lot of nothingness. And I think that nothingness is is something that that is that is a hard question. That is what I'm talking about. Like how how did that evolve? over time and of course like if you look at the event industry uh the whole pandemic i don't want to get too much in the pandemic thing but the whole pandemic left a mark on the industry uh you see that with ticket sales people wait till the last time to go a ticket uh, get a ticket and um that all adds up because uh, event organizers don't want to take the risk anymore because they know their cash flow is is is, is shorter and they need to wait on their money way longer and and that brings back to that uh, dives back to the artists that um, uh, need to ask maybe less fees or something or have to adapt to that new uh, way of working. Uh, so I think there are a lot of things due to the pandemic that changed the industry as well. But in in um, uh, before that already, I think that the, the music industry is more about passion than money. Uh, yeah. yeah, then you, you just have that gap in between uh, yeah, I think the gap is a really good explanation. So thank you for, you know, giving your your opinion about that. But but when you talk about What do you money, think? I'm, I'm interested what you think. It's, it's, it's well, a really interesting question. Yeah, well I, I, I do agree to a big to a big degree. I, I also believe that it's an industry that is undervalued by consumers, not by individual consumers, but the markets. You know, yes. when it comes to, for example, you know, prices, price increase with Spotify that came this year, and it's been years and years and years with no increase. So there's a lot of inflation automatically devaluing, you know, music. And I think the the system around the consumption of music uh, is devaluing music. Uh, there's there's a lot of like elements of that where it's just an integral part of our culture. So and it doesn't have the same physical, tangible value as going to the cinema and and buying a ticket. Uh, it, it, you can compare it to to a concert, yes, but it's also very much different because the margins are much different. You know, it's yeah. the, 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 it's a different industry and it's a different approach. And and when you look at, you know, I was just, uh, you know, when I was eating my 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 lunch today, I was just watching a, a Jamie Oliver video when they talk about McKinsey uh, and talked about, you know, it was a fun video, but they talked about the a- annual revenues of being fifteen billion dollars a year, right? That's yes. half of the recording music lot. industry in in one company. So, so the industry is small because of a lot of different things, and which also means that the potentials are smaller or there's a few companies that really has a lot of power just culminated in it and things. There's so many aspects to it. And, and, you know, but, but I really like your explanation because it really gives a really clear example of one of the reasons. But, well, let's call it more. It's a symptom description, you, you said. And yes. that, that might be Go a reason, on. right? Um. But also, I, I do believe there's a lot of potential for when you make it, if you make it. There's, you know, a company that's acquired doesn't need to be a little amount. And that sort of feedbacks into a question, what is your end goal with Stagent? The, the, the what, sorry? Your end goal. Like, what, end, what do you want to take this? The do end you want goal. to this at one point? Or like, what's, what's your goal? Uh, like, um, I think I'm... You know, at a point where I don't really have an end goal yet. Uh, of course, I have like goals with product, and I know when I want to go with the product itself. But yeah, the the the, the big hairy goal of, of the mall is is being 
the one platform for all the booking agencies as well as artists but as well as speakers like other industries like other verticals that we can discover um i like to to say that every everyone who performs on something could use stage it um and then everything around that performer is also uh, on stage and so if you can if you can manage that and uh, play away all the other competitors and that that will be like the end goal of course yeah Good. um so yeah uh, and and like very very long time uh, long term uh if if we become like this successful company that um that is is at a point where we need like a dedicated ceo i would like to be sort of head of product or something just yeah. focus on product, um, be with a team to brainstorm about new features. How we, can we deliver new cool things for artists? Maybe we can focus on artist management, where we can start integrating tools that help them with social media or uh, launch their website or gain insights uh, about artists for agencies to scout new talent. There's so many ideas what we can what we can do. And um, I think it, it's not only about bookings. It's way more than that. Yeah. That makes sense. It's a very good and informing answer as well. Well, well, I'm we're very happy we had this talk. Yeah, and thank you for you being open and honest about your journey. Um, I'm definitely going to follow Stagent for for a long time because we use the we we use the platform, but also because I think it's a really interesting case. Um, I I really love when people do things that I uh, think is excellent, and that's sort of definitely the vibe I'm getting for you guys. That's what you striving for, and already now in many degrees are achieving. Um, well, thanks for these kind of words. Yeah, if you the, the last question I'm going to ask is obviously this is a, a podcast for entrepreneurs in the music industry. Is if you were to give yourself or others an advice about being an entrepreneur in the music industry, what would that be? Focus. <laughs> Focus. Focus. Yeah. Like, um, I'm. I'm. I'm not the best at it either like uh, maybe even the worst that i think but like it's so important to focus on the right things and uh time is of the essence you know so you really have to invest your time in the right things um so yeah focus is really important uh and and most entrepreneurs are really bad at it <laughs> so try to get that on a on a good level that would okay. be my advice to myself yeah and to others I felt that was an advice to me as well. So I uh, thank you so much for that advice and <laughs> and everyone else listening out there. Well, Misha, it's it's been a pleasure. Um, hope we can catch up at one festival at one point. I, I'm definitely planning to come to ADA at one p- point so that I, I, I can imagine you're going to be at ADA every single year absolutely. and having fun. You yeah. should absolutely come there next year. Yeah. And we can have well, a drink. Absolutely. There's a lot of startup things happening. You know, it's been really spamming my Instagram feed with all, everything that's happening at ADA and the initiatives they're doing, so... That's amazing. Yeah, it's great. It's really great. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, good luck with the rest of the podcast. Uh, you're onto something, so keep it going. Thank you, man. Talk soon.